without further ado, let me introduce Sharon Skoll. Sharon Skoll is a retired university humanities professor who convenes a poetry critique group, a gathering of poets in Ponte Vedra. She has had over a hundred poems published in national literary journals. Her poetry collections, Timescape, Seasons, and Remains are available on Amazon Books. So um, please, Sharon, uh, take it away. Thank mm -hmm. you. All right. Uh, yeah, through the years, you know, I've got a lot of stuff and, and they mostly look like this. We've got the, the uh, even song is the latest and then we have um, remains, uh, let's see, my seasons and an old one, a book of travel poems, all points bulletin. Anyway, um, they were a lot of fun to do and um, I hope you get some and enjoy them. Um, we're looking today at um, a very interesting thing. What do you do when you get stuck? You know, we all get stuck. Uh, with me, it, I can't find a stinking word. It has to be just a perfect word and you go through the thesaurus and it's not there and you agonize over it. We all do. You get stuck sometimes because you want to write about something and you just don't know how to do it. But I've got a, an unstuck proposition for you today and um i'll put it on the screen if i i can get this thing to come up now let's see i have to uh oh wait a minute share screen okay and share here <laughs> you got it okay does everybody see that thing all right you're good sharon good yep. okay all righty. Um, what I want to do is get the thing up and I can't. Oh, gosh. Uh, I'm not sure how to do this. Um, I want to, to get it up a little bit. And uh, the, uh, the pictures are covering what I want to do. Oh, gosh. This is so maddening. I'm sorry, I need to get above this and don't know how to get rid of the pictures over here so I can. Okay, up in your upper uh, right hand corner, there's going to be, um, there should be like uh, three little ellipses gotcha. and a dash. If you right. hit that little dash, it should make all the people go away. Uh, okay. Where all the boxes of where the people yeah, are. I got it. I got it. Oh, good, 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 good. Here we go. Okay. So what I'm suggesting is plunder a poem. It, it doesn't sound nice, but it, it's fun. Um, it's a funny name for using an existing poem to plan your own poem. Take words, phrases. You don't even have to like the thing, um, but um, you know, uh, you can follow the poem's development, see how it starts, how it ends, you know, what the poet does with the stuff that the poet has. Um, and so anyway, that that's the idea of it. So why would you do such a thing? Well, you know, you're fresh out of ideas and you want to get started on something and, you know, that kind of stuff um, and need something to, to just jump start it. Um, or um, you... Um, one of the, the things that I do is I'd like to learn to write in a different style or a different kind of language or maybe a different format. And I'm not sure how to go about it. So I'll find a poem that I think does it pretty well and I'll just practice it. I'll, I'll just do what they did, but using a, a different kind of subject or different vocabulary. Um, Excuse me, it keeps going that way. Okay, and um, so then um, how you do it is um, just select your poem and create a subject title that parallels that to the original poem. It's not the same, but it's a nice parallel. And then you search that original poem for suggested language as how to go and see what you can do with it, you know? Um, and um, it, 
but the thing is, the one big warning that, that I'd like to give is that um, if you really, really like what you've got and you think, wow, this thing is publishable, you cannot do it without contacting the writer of the original poem and asking them for permission, showing them their original poem and what you've done with it and finding out if they will approve of what you've done, if it's different enough from their poem to be an independent poem. Now, luckily, <laughs> I have done this actually and um, gotten some agreement that it's okay, but I have, have gotten disagreement with poets that say, no, that's too close. I wouldn't feel comfortable with this. And if you get that response, you, the poem is dead. It's flat out dead in the water. But you've learned something from it. it it's not a total loss at all. But luckily, I chose a poem that I admired very much by a wonderful poet friend of mine who is also a member of the Gathering of Poets. And I liked it and I really wanted to write something like it. But we are so fortunate because we have the original author, Shetta Crum, here today. And I'd like to ask her to read her original poem. Shetta, are you there, bud? Yes, I am. Can you hear me okay? You're fine. Okay, good. Yes, and I certainly gave um, Sharon permission. I thought her poem was wonderful as well. So this is an oldie. Um, my mother was a master quilter. So this is a poem called, My Mother Taught Me to Quilt. My mother taught me to quilt, how to measure width and length, how to find shades of a rainy day or the hue of a child's trust. I watched as she patched each day's pieces into a kaleidoscopic hole, and she always saved the scraps. She taught me to ease dissonance, into harmonies of pattern and to blind stitch. She tugged and I saw that the straight grain was strong, but she said, I must learn to work with bias. Mm -hmm. There are days when fabric needs to stretch. I studied how she smoothed the layers, how she rocked her needle, hand stitching it all to a strong back. And finally, how she held me bundled in her patchwork. Now on rainy days, I walk out into the wet grass and collect my colors, the impatient greens, the heart deep browns, the glistening grays, and the fresh wash blue of a forget-me-not. I measure, I cut, I rock my needle, I bind my raw edges. <laughs> That's such a wonderful poem, especially, you know, as it ends and you realize that it's more than just a quilt. It, it's a life and a, and a way to live it. Just wonderful. So thank I thought, to, yeah, she'll, she'll have to go ahead. No, I just said thank you. I oh, yeah. Okay. Well, um, so I thought, oh, you know, um, I have people that have taught me things and, and I'd like to sort of do what Shutter did and pay tribute to them. So I thought I, my a grandpa taught me to garden. And now you notice the little numbers that I've got these are the places that are really derivative. But gardening is very different from quilting. So down in there somewhere, I'm going to have to let go of that original model. And sure enough, you notice after the number five on the right hand side there, notice how he flicked the moisture. That there's just no, no parallel on the left, except I wanted to end the poem by coming to the present and telling what I gained from those early lessons. So I'm really paralleling the last verse of my mother taught me to quilt, but just applying it to a, a very different context. So my poem goes, <clears throat> my grandpa taught me to garden how to measure the black bed, count out seeds resembling small splinters, shedding torn coats. I watched as he poked a finger into soil, dense as chocolate cake, 
dropped one seed in each moist well. He taught me to plot my planting into harmonies of pattern, leave room for my spouts to breathe so every leaf has space to stretch. I noticed how he flicked moisture from his fingers so all could drink but none would drown, how he set the watering can swaying like a pendulum toward his open palm. Every spring, I renew his lesson, measuring, counting, planting, watering, taking my turn to care for this young and fragile life. And notice, you have to give credit to the original poet. But when you look at the uh, the numbered things, uh, number two, how to measure width and length. And two, how to measure the black bed. Uh, three, I watched as she patched each day's pieces. I watched as she poked a finger into soil. Then four, she taught me to ease dissonance. He taught me to plant my plotting into harmonies. Notice into harmonies, the same thing here. And five, I studied how she smoothed the layers. I noticed how he flicked moisture. It's so much alike and so much different, you know? Um, and so this, my mother taught me to quilt, was really so inspirational to me in, in knowing how to go about some tribute poem like this. So I want to suggest that you might kind of have fun. This is a very quick ride. We, we just want to get a start on this. So um, would you um, just think about my something? My uncle taught me to curse. My dog taught me to play. Whatever person or thing or it taught you something, get a title first and then write just two or three lines to get started on the thing that describe how that thing was done and how it was demonstrated to you. Everybody got that? You get the title, a person or whoever, and a thing they taught you, and then write a little description about how that thing goes, what, what was actually taught to you. Okay, here we go. I'm going to give you just two minutes on this, so run ahead. Bingo. All right, our two minutes are up. <laughs> it would be kind of fun to see what you, you've come up with. Um, so can we hear from Angie, Cheryl, Elizabeth, Lee, 
uh, Mia. Um, what do we got? Uh, part. We got she, Wendy, Yasmin, shut up, Ruth, anybody out there? What you got? Mm -hmm. We got 14 of us. Come on. Well, I guess I could share mine, but it, it hasn't really formed yet. It's just oh. my mother taught me angels are real. And then I was going to go into different facets of angels. Oh, neat. Um, okay. Yeah. I mean, that's a start right there. Anybody else? Yes. My aunt taught me to eat less butter. <laughs> How did she do that? Yeah. Had a, and I've done a description as well. She Go saw ahead. me stand. She saw me standing in my parents' sweet shop in my favorite soft brown velvet dress, eating a raw, cold, hard cube of butter, and said again, "I stood looking at her, a woman only four foot nine, with a gossipy mind, and felt briefly guilty as she walked away, away, and I carried on on my way. She wasn't a real aunt, blood related, but out of respect." A family friend. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> oh, Lordy. Anybody else? Come on. Let me get yeah. Yeah. I thought I should maybe do one for my dad. After oh, good. I had the quote one for my mom. So yeah. I had my father taught me to lie. <laughs> and I, that only comes about because he had Alzheimer's at the end. Uh -huh. And he always told these whopping stories that everybody believed because he believed them. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, thank you. Oh, great. Someone else? Anyone? Well, those are particularly fun. And thank you for, uh, for you know, participating in that strange little exercise. Um, let's go on. I've got two or three of these possibilities. Okay, so the first is you take a poem that interests you, you know, and that makes you think, oh, I've had an experience like that. And you see if you can outline it and if you can shape it as nicely as that original poet did. Okay, so here's the second one. I call this a rebuttal poem. Uh, you find a poem and you think, uh, oh, that's nice. And it can be by a very famous poet. I mean, holy cats, look down here, Mary Oliver. That's about as great a poet, a poet as you can get. And yet you read the thing and you think, oh, yeah, right. Especially if you share a slightly different temperament as I do. Well, let's see what she has to say. These are some questions you might ask, and there are really four of them. Question one, is the soul solid like iron? You know, what's the soul made of? That's the question. Second one, who has it and who doesn't? The third one is, does it have a shape like an iceberg? And the fourth, why should I have it and not, you know, other things? And here's what she says. Is the soul like iron or is it tender and breakable like the wings of a moth and the beak of an owl? Who has it and who doesn't? I keep looking around me. The face of the mouse is as sad as the face of Jesus. The swan opens her white wings slowly. In the fall, the black bear carries leaves into the darkness. One question leads to another. Does it have a shape like an iceberg? like the eye of a hummingbird? Does it have one lung like the snake and the scallop? Why should I have it and not the anteater who loves her children? Why should I have it and not the camel? Come to think about it, why not the maple trees? What about the blue iris? What about all the little stones sitting alone in the moonlight? What about roses and lemons and their shining leaves? What about the grass. <laughs> I think she just gets absolutely nutty, you know, really off in the bushes with his poem. And I'm such an old cynic that I just don't see it that way. So I've done a rebuttal poem, some answers you might give. Questions about soul aren't answerable. So I'll pass on this one. That, that's not, that's cheating, folks. However, if one should walk in and say, guess what, I'm a soul, I'd be open to correction. 
If there were soul, everything would have one, mountains to molecules. They would be shaped by the possessor according to preference. Since souls are imaginary, why shouldn't their shapes be too? Souls aren't graded by species or aesthetics. They would be pure democracy, jostling about the firmament in perfect harmony. <laughs> okay, I, I, you know, I, it just teed me off. So anyway, I'm, I'm thinking you might kind of have fun with this one too. Why don't you write on anything you, you've got handy, some answers you might give. And, um, Let's answer that first question, maybe. What is the soul like? What is the soul like? And I'll give you another two minutes on this. one. Just get a few lines, a couple of three or four lines of some question, some answers you might give. What is the soul like? And you're, you would start, the soul is, and you go ahead. Here we go. All righty, let's see if you have solved the, <laughs> the great question of all times. You know, what is a soul? What is a soul like? Um, anybody, um, what have you got? I liked the beams like the sun. That's fine. Beats like the heart, but isn't red. <laughs> Makes one human, loving, warm, and kind. That's a good start. That's a good yeah. start. What is the soul? It's like the sun, something beautiful and red. Yeah, lovely stuff. Anybody else? I can go, Sharon. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I don't know if, if I didn't quite answer exactly. But I got some, <laughs> to start a poem, some answers you might have. My hand is searching inside my torn t-shirt touches my bra, my breasts, wonders, where is that thing called soul? And what does it look like? And how can I find it? Outside, night declares itself supreme. I stand at the window and pull the neck of my t-shirt back up. I point to Orion. Is my soul there, crazed mm -hmm. among the stars? That's it. Oh, that's terrific. Yeah. It's hard to feature if it's where it is, if it is, you know, in you or out there. Um, interesting way to put it. Good. Anybody else with that? Ruth, have you take, done any of these?
I'm dealing with administrative stuff. <laughs> You're too busy with that. I know what you mean. Yeah, Parv, uh, Z, Wendy, Yasmin, what about it? Um, I could read mine, but I think I got more too cerebral with this. But oh, that's just, fine. I'll just read what it is. Okay. The soul is a vessel for, for spirit, as I understand it, a sort of personalizing filter, a making the divine spark your own, not self-created, but shaped, a nexus point for cooperating with grace. Ooh, that's a lovely little, you could, I mean, that's a poem in itself right there. Yeah, yeah. Oh, thanks. Yeah, shaping that spark, you know, it, it's there, but it doesn't have a shape, so you give it one. And that answers the question, too, about how would they be shaped? Good, good. Anybody else? All righty. Well, um, why don't we look at this this third thing I have down here that you might enjoy? Um, it's another uh, plunder poem. Uh, the this is is a, a poem by Seamus Haney, the famous um, Irish uh, poet, and he does something that I like. You know, he he takes an animal here and. Um, then he he uses the animal as a kind of reference to his life and relationships and all. And that's where I kind of thought maybe he didn't need that. But let me read his poem first. Uh, the skunk, up, black, striped, and damasked like the chasuble at a funeral mass. The skunk's tail paraded the skunk. Night after night, I expected her like a visitor. The refrigerator whinnied into silence. My desk light softened beyond the veranda. Small oranges loomed in the orange tree. I began to be tense as a voyeur. After 11 years, I was composing love letters again, broaching the word wife like a stored cask, as though its slender vowel had mutated into the night earth and air of California. The beautiful, useless tang of eucalyptus spelled your absence. Af aftermath of a mouthful of wine was like inhaling you off a cold pillow. And there she was, the intent and glamorous, ordinary, mysterious skunk, mythologized, demythologized, snuffing the boards five feet beyond me. It all came back to me last night stirred by the soup fall of your things at bedtime, your head down, tail up, hunt in a bottom drawer for the black plunge line nightdress. <laughs> How so much fun. Well, I like this very much, but then I thought that, that he just got too far astray. Are you going to write about a skunk or aren't you? You know, were the things that, that sort of got me. So I really like you know, the way he started, and then uh, that there was a kind of, the second verse, it shows you where he is in the poem in relationship to this skunk. And I thought, yeah, you know, that's a pretty good technique. And then uh, all of this reference, I, I just it didn't get me, except that I love uh, certain words, tenses of voyeur, you notice over here, the voyeur in, my, um, in me, uh, and then I love this line, and there she was. And I've got that now, weeks before snow, there she is. Uh, I did pick up those exactly, but the rest of it, I, I really, then when you got down to this last verse, I thought that was very effective. Why this, this skunk sort of made an impression and how it is now, what, what it's going to remain for me in the future. And that I wanted to do in this last. So here's what I did. And again, I put adapted from Seamus Haney's The Skunk. The fawn, hidden in the bushes, its dappled back sprinkled like freckles on a child's face. The fawn steps delicately among fallen branches, crinkled leaves in her nightly ramble. 
the voyeur in me peers in wonder from a dark room masked beyond a window. Weeks before snow, there she is, haunting the autumn glade, dressed in her matchy coat. Years from now, I'll see some hunter's mounted trophy and feel the anguish of her loss. So, you know, the plot is, is very similar, the rhythm, the way the thing goes. Um, and yet the animal is very different and the language about the animal is very different. Uh, and except for these direct pickups from a couple of spots, this is, is a reasonably um, a unique or, or individual poem. It's sort of a poem to itself. So there you go, you know, um, poems can inspire you and um, they can give you some wonderful ideas and show you a rhythm, a way to proceed that is very, very helpful, even though what you choose is quite different and the way that you describe it is quite different. So plunder poems, I think, are, are just a terrific a way to teach yourself things. So why don't we try? And let's pick out your own animal. Uh, if it's not a skunk or the fawn, it could be a snake, a dog, at most anything, a flower for goodness sake, um, anything animal, vegetable, or mostly mineral. I wouldn't mind a rock. Um, and then uh, talk about, you know, this, this uh, thing that you've chosen, what it's like, what it looks like, what it feels like, how it moves, all of these good details, and then where you are in relationship to it. Have you just stepped on it and fallen over it, or, or where are you? Um, think about those things. Let's see if we can get just a few lines down into it. Um, choose your thing and just give a start on it. Here we go. Let's give maybe mm, four minutes to this one.
All righty. It looks like we have spent our time happily here, and I've um, got you all together. And um, all 14 of you have stuck loyally with this thing. <laughs> and I hope you've gotten something fun out of it. Would someone like to read, you know, uh, tell us what you've chosen and what you had to say about it? I'll go. Go ahead. Uh, my animal, well, you'll, you know, let me just read it. Okay. Yeah. There she is, very visible. Cockeyed urban rat, one eye pink, one eye black. Whiskers whisking back and forth, tasting, sensing the environment around it. Hungry, searching for food and for warmth. Dark furry body pressed against the laneway wall to make itself so small and visible to predators beyond the wall. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. That's fun. You press against the wall and for a good reason if you're that small. Great, great stuff. Good. Anybody else with, with a beast or animal, vegetable, or mineral that you've chosen? Hi, I chose a tulip, the flower. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. So the blooming here in the UK is a spring season. Whenever yeah. I go, they just give you so much joy. And it's like, yay. So um, tulip, I didn't know edible neither. You can actually eat them. So soft edible petals that close at night from invaders. Once expensive as diamonds, the sun bloom at springtime, queen of the night, dark purple. Blue is very rare. Used in place of onions in cooking and to make wine. White says, I'm sorry. Red is the color of love. Love like Fahad and Sharon who died and red tulips bloomed from their bodies. Mm. Cut a fresh one, cut a fresh one from the grass, plonk it in a fancy vase and watch it bloom only for a day or two. They last three to five years, fresh. Yellow, the colour of joy, happiness and spring, line the fresh grass outside the day centre. The old man looks out, listening to the little busy bees at the nearby play school. Tulips on the cemetery, dancing in colours of red, yellow, pink and violet. Oh, wow, nice. I'm so jealous. Here in Florida, we, we just cannot raise poop tulips. Our heat just exhausts them. You really? know? Oh. Oh, and you have to dig them up and put them in the refrigerator all winter, you know, and <laughs> hope that oh, does it. The, I think the best we can manage is amaryllis. Um, but I can't imagine what a tulip um, petal tastes like. I've, I'll try it. <laughs> I've got to find out. That's amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Good. Anybody else? What, what you got? I can go again. Go ahead, Shetta. Yeah. Um, yeah, I like this prompt. Um, I wrote about a pine martin that I saw up in the wilds in Canada one time. And they're like a weasel, if you don't know what a pine martin is. Small oh. and weasel you know, with a curve yeah. set up. So the pine martin. The thin body slid like water beneath the bracken, flowing across a downed tree trunk on silent feet, its small pointed nose intent, unwavering. And I, standing on the riverbank, did not move, watched it hunch its back into a question mark for a moment, and then determined it slipped away into the altar and tamarisk. And I felt smaller. Um, and I felt smaller, more nebulous, less profound than that creature of the wild. Yeah, interesting that that you've got a good description of it, and and it also you come down to where you are in relationship to it. Yeah, I mean, it needs more work, obviously, but at yeah. least it's a start. So that's something. It's a start. Yeah, yeah, that sounds terrific. Anyone else have one? I guess I could go. It's very rough, though. But uh, Okay, let's see. Mom was quite unreasonable, not letting me get a dolphin to live in our pool. By age 12, I sighed she was right, not enough room. Turn to ocean instead, plunge in, spot their pods sometimes at dawn, magic ever. Though no longer convinced won't fit, sense of swimming in my soul. Mm -mm, how neat the idea of 
of needing to possess something that beautiful, you know, in, in a place that you could access it. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a lovely way to do it. It really is. <laughs> Good. Good. Anybody else? Yeah, I'd like to go. Okay. After more than 30 years, I write nature poems again, holding holding you close, fragile flower of my youth, reminding me on bended knee how much I love thee. Daffodil doll, long gone, but I have you, flower, to remind me of love, of youth, of childhood dreams, shiny, shining in the sun, withering in the heat. Mm -hmm. Oh, daffodils gone before late spring. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting. I think maybe even the word daffodil sounds like a child's rhyme. You know, it, it does. It just, it sort of smells and tastes of childhood and memory. What a lovely way to do it. <laughs> Good. Good. Somebody else. Yeah, Renee, is that you or was it you? Hey, that was me reading. <laughs> oh, good. Okay, that was still your name on the on the screen. Okay. Anyone else? Wendy, Yasmin, Mia. Well, this is a a good place to stop. Then um, it's one of those things in which um, it's just a lovely technique, and you can have so much fun with it but you can also sometimes get some really good results with it you know you you think um using another poet as your guide uh, that's the way all people learn to to be good at their art think about the renaissance when you worked in a workshop of a master and literally you copied right everything the master did you copied and copied um, until you finally learned enough that you could do it on your own we don't have much respect for that way of learning anymore but it's a darn good way to do it and I, I recommend it to you so Ruth do you have some close out you would like to do um let me Check my instructions. I do want to, again, uh, ask people to, and I put it in the chat box, there is a link um, to fill out a survey uh, about the workshop. Thank you so much, uh, again, Sharon, yeah. for doing this wonderful workshop on plunder poems. Uh, it's been uh, a wonderful afternoon hour here with you. Um, we have other great workshops going on in this next final week of April National Poetry Month Jack's Poetry Fest. Um, and I encourage everyone to attend those final workshops. And um, yes, uh, support uh, Jack's Poetry Fest and Hope at Hand, all their wonderful programs that they do um, in in our area and extending beyond. Of course, the being these workshops are online, we can do them worldwide, and so wonderful opportunity um, to have all these great poets and authors that. Uh, offer these free workshops so um yeah without further ado i guess that's a wrap um okay. unless sharon might want to share one or two of her poems from her newest book that came out i think it was this month or last month um that might be a special treat um, oh, yes well let's see um, this last one was um, uh, was the the um, 
or even song. I'm so ancient, I keep thinking I'm going to drop off the earth. And these are my <laughs> last words. <laughs> but anyway, uh, have you, those of you that have, you know, a uh, Christian background or whatnot are Jewish, know that gorgeous, gorgeous uh, Christmas hymn, uh, Bain the Emmanuel. Rejoice, rejoice. Oh, 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 da, da, da. Uh, Rejoice, rejoice, I sing once more as I've sung for 80 years, a lifetime of vocal expectation. Even now, a time without saviors, I chant this ancient trope to preserve the long unbroken song. For 1200 years, passed from voice to voice, from the dying to the living, to those who will be, Emmanuel will come to thee. An ageist melody outlasting all the chaos of the human story. Because there may be a time when hope is fresh and saviors are believable. I'll sing for those to come. <laughs> sing on, dear ones. Thank you so much, Sharon. It was wonderful. Quite a treat. Thank you everyone for coming to this workshop um, and have a wonderful rest of your day.